Good evening, everybody. Um, it's seven o'clock, so we might as well start. My name is Shauna McDermott, and I'm one of the associate program directors of the Diagnostic Radiology Residency here at MGH. And I'm delighted that you have joined us today to hear more about our residency and also um, why we think MGH is a great place to work and Boston is a great place to live. And I would first like to ask Dr. McLeod, the program director, to say a few words. Yes. Uh, well, welcome, everyone. I'm delighted that so many have joined the webinar. I'm the uh, program director in diagnostic radiology. And um, what I would like to do first is introduce you to uh, the chairman of our department, Dr. James Spring. Jim, could you say a few words? Yeah, thanks so much, uh, Dr. McLeod. Uh, first, um, I need to get you a more recent picture. I wish I looked that young today. <laughs> um, second, uh, it, this is always a, a bit nostalgic uh, for me because uh, more years ago than I wish to uh, admit, I was in uh, the shoes of many of you that are looking across the country and trying to decide um, where would be a, the best fit for your residency training. Um, I chose uh, MGH and I was pleased that they ended up choosing me and uh, I uh, really um, have such fond memories of my days as a trainee at this, uh, at this hospital. I think the, um, the things I wanted to share tonight, and I, I know I just have a few brief moments to, to do so, but, but um, really I think if you, you will find that our department that if it has almost anything to do with imaging, even remotely to do with imaging, you'll find it going on somewhere in our, in our department. It's a, in one respect, it's a very large department with so many facets to it. And in other respects, it's a very personal department, meaning that uh, particularly the residency, the residency is, the, is really the, the crown jewel of the department. And you'll find that just about everyone who is involved in some facet of imaging will welcome it with open arms to, to participate with them. And whether it be a, a new clinical venture, a legacy clinical venture, a new research opportunity, or just opportunities to get involved in uh, any host of, of activities that uh, tie to the practice and science of, of our profession. So, so with that, I, I hope you'll find it as exciting and stimulating a place to work as I have. And um, uh, I, I know you'll have a, a good evening this evening. And many thanks to all of the members of our department who are here tonight as well to help uh, share their experiences with you. So thank you. And back to you, Teresa. OK, thank you. Okay, so first we're just going to introduce a few of the people who will be talking today. Can I see next slide? So as well as um, Dr. McLeod and Dr. Brink and myself, we also have a few other attendings who are involved in research and um, women in radiology and also in diversity within the department. And next slide. As well as the faculty presenters, we have a lot of our residents um, presenting here today. And as you can see, they're from a vast um, diverse schools and backgrounds, um, which is great to see. And hopefully during the webinar, we'll answer most of your questions. But if you have any questions that we're not answering, please put them into the Q&A and we'll answer as we go along. So first, and um, we'll talk about the interview process for the radiology residency here. And can we have the next slide? And um, so what will the virtual interviews look like? So next slide. So the application is like previously, it's through ERAS, and you have all hopefully um, done this. And we've just had the opportunity last week to see all the number of applicants that have applied. And next slide. You can see from um, Twitter that the application numbers have gone up across the board. And because we do such a thorough um, review of all our applications, looking at all facets, including the um, letters of recommendations and um, transcripts from med school, your personal statements, your USMLE results, uh, research ventures. It takes quite a while. So how we do it here is we look at all the applications and then decide who we're going to invite. So the invites request won't be going out for um, a couple of weeks yet. And then, um, so this is the second year of the virtual interviews and there's a lot of online um, information on how to how best to prepare for the interviews. And these were the ones that were available last year. And next slide. And there's been multiple updated ones after the first year of virtual interviews from multiple different um, uh, residency programs across America. So how we do that 
here and also even on Twitter. So we've got one radiologist who is going to put up um, uh, YouTube videos on all interview advice. And then even next slide, there is a intern who is putting up her tips. And this is a woman who's going to be starting with us in July. And as she says, you have to remember that the current interview or the current intern class is the only group to have ever gone through this virtual um, interview cycle. So make sure you ask anyone you know about um, advice and recommendations. So what people have been saying is obviously make sure you have a good internet connection, good lighting, um, and the content is virtually the same as you would have in an in-person interview. Um, here at MGH, we do have some pre-interview social event, sort of happy hour with the residents. And then on the day of the interview, you get to do a virtual tour of the department. Um, you also get to have a panel discussion with residents. And then you have usually four different interviews with um, different people in the department. So, I mean, so I'm Rory Cochran. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in tonight. I'm one of the chief residents. Um, so that's, you know, it's a lot taking virtual interviews into account and things are different in this era. Um, but you must be wondering, you know, how do I show my interest? Like how, how, without being able to come in person, see Boston, how do I get to show my interest? And how do I get to know a little bit about the city? Um, what we can say to you is come, um, come with your questions via email. Uh, last season, I spoke with people on the phone. I did Zoom sessions. Um, I also, you know, had email correspondence with uh, multiple interview um, interviewees that were interested in, and we'll be honest with you. We want you to make the best informed decision you can, and we want you to be happy with your decision, um, just as um, you do. So uh, we're here to help, and uh, we encourage you to reach out to us, uh, reach out to us after the interviews, um, but also reach out to us before the interviews, or um, if you're not sure and you're trying to make a decision next year when it comes to the rank list, please reach out. We are here to help. Um, and that goes for everybody that's tuned in here tonight. Next slide, please. Um, so you probably have realized from my accent that I am not from around here and also an international medical graduate, but I did it the other version and went and did residency in Ireland before coming over here for fellowship. But I do have a soft spot for the international medical graduates and we're gonna get one of our own, Manuel Patino, to discuss his um, his experience with the application and working and living in Boston. Buenas noches a todos, bienvenidos. Um, I am Manny, I'm one of the third year residents. Um, so happy, first of all, that the, you guys uh, are joining this webinar. Uh, I went to medical school in Bogota, Colombia, and then uh, I did some research here in, in Boston then um, I joined um, MGH um, and yes, MGH considers um, a international uh, medical graduate um, the applications. And in fact, MGH is a, a MGH radiology is a, a very friendly program uh, with international medical graduates. There is at least one IMG uh, in each class currently and uh, we have had, uh, like, I, I have met at least 15 uh, international medical graduates from, um, from the recent years. Um, uh, they are in different um, uh, visas right now. It can be J1 to the ACFMG, or it can uh, be an H, uh, sponsored by the program. Um, and uh, my experience as, a, as an IMG in this program uh, cannot be better. Um, I am extremely happy I, uh, I chose this program and uh, I'm honored they chose me. Um, and uh, I have learned a big deal. I feel part of this family and they also learn different things from us. If you have any questions, uh, like please feel free to reach out via email. Uh, I'm going to um, type my email address. Thank you. And um, so now we're just going to um, go on and do an overview of the radiology residency program. And I'll ask Dr. McLeod to go through um, sort of what the four years of radiology here at MGH diagnostic radiology looks like. 
Thank you very much, Shauna. So I want to discuss, first of all, the structure of the program. And our program, in some ways, is rather new, unique, or it used to be unique, uh, because back in the 1980s, actually, we uh, offered a sp specific type of program for the fourth year. So let me go through the different years and give you just a summary. I won't read everything. I'm sure you can see what is included. But R1, you learn all the fundamental rotations. Most of them are two weeks to four weeks since chest, GI, neuro, MSK, pediatrics, uh, the yeah, uh, the emergency room. Uh, you become familiar with all the different modalities for imaging, including the standard radiograph, CT, MRI, fluoro, and ultrasound. Uh, in the second year, uh, the uh, program is focused on subspecialty areas and procedural rotations uh, and includes cardiovascular, PET. We have the fortunate, uh, we're very fortunate to have right next door to us uh, the Massachusetts Eye and Ear Infirmary. And for those of you who become interested in head and neck radiology, it's a tremendous opportunity to have them so close. But everyone has the opportunity to rotate for a, a two to three week rotation during your second year. And you learn some basic procedures um, in breast and chest and musculoskeletal, such as needle biopsies, for example. Then our three year advanced clinical rotations. Uh, we have uh, a research center, the Martino Center, and the residents spend some time there. Uh, with the emphasis being on MRI physics. Um, there are neuro procedures, GI and chest MRI are taught in the third year. And then there are outside rotations. We have a couple of opportunities. First of all, uh, we've always had electives that we share with the Brigham and Women's Hospital uh, and the ones that have been popular, the oncology rotation to the Dana-Farber Institute and also ultrasound. They're really expert in ultrasound at, at the Brigham. We also have a rotation to the Mount Auburn hospital, which is a Harvard teaching hospital, but more like a community hospital. But often residents who may be more interested in doing procedures often go there. And those who are in the IR program or maybe have been in the DR and thinking maybe to switch to IR because they work, you can work directly with the uh, attending. Uh, they don't have, they have residents there, but they don't have fellows. So it's kind of a unique opportunity. And you get to know the culture of a community hospital. We, uh, there's opportunity to, uh, and others will discuss this in more depth, but we do have a global health program in Rwanda. Uh, and we also give you some protected time to study for the American Board of Radiology core examination, which comes at the end of that third year. Um, next slide. Okay, I want to talk about the fourth year. What was unique about this, as I said, it's been in effect since the late 1980s, but we thought the fourth year ought to be a specialty year. And you can devote either six months of the entire year to a subspecialty area. So it's equivalent in a way ways to a fellowship training. It's still part of the residency, so you can't claim that you've done a fellowship, but it allows you uh, to explore an area where you ha may have a major interest. And uh, you can do, as I said, said, the short term, which is six months or the full 12 months. You can begin your two year fellowship during the fourth year in neuro and IR. Uh, so for example, if you were in the diagnostic program, but you died, decided to switch to IR, you can use that fourth year. And neuroradiology has a two year fellowship. So you can uh, complete the first part of that uh, during the fourth year of your residency and it shortens the training program. Uh, one of the other uh, advantages of this particular fourth year structure is that it had, there is an option for six months of research. And we've had a number of residents who've had grants from RSNA and elsewhere, and they can design a program for themselves where they have six months to complete their research. And then the opportunity exists to participate in some of the other programs that we have, and you'll hear about these in the later presentations, but like the management and leadership training program is a six month program, and that can be done during that focused year. Thank you. Hi everyone, uh, I'm Sam Carbon, one of the chief residents. So I just wanted to provide sort of brief sort of day in the life, what uh, what your life looks like when um, you're in residency here and, and particularly highlighting the didactic sessions. So every morning um, at 7.30, we have um, an attending come in, it's a case conference. So uh, residents will uh, take an unknown case and um, 
this is sort of, you know, we've structured it such that uh, in the early parts of the year, it's sort of more basic cases and then the uh, complexity uh, will build over time. Um, so it sort of simulates the uh, environment you might be in when um, you are taking a consult from, you know, an internal medicine physician, for instance. Um, and then at noon conference, we have um, a mini course schedule. So we go through each um, subject matter, uh, whether it be like thoracic radiology, neuroradiology, et cetera. Um, we sort of, over the course of the year, hit all of those. And we've made a few changes recently to try to uh, better um, embed some of the, you know, foundational understanding, uh, for instance, in physics. Um, we're now trying to embed that more into the, uh, the mini courses themselves. So you get, uh, so the clinical application is, is uh, better illustrated. And in addition to the mini courses, uh, well, at the end of each mini course, uh, there is a journal club where uh, a group of residents will review literature from that uh, topic area. And we have had many visiting lecturers, um, even more so now in the, in the Zoom era where um, there's even less barrier to, to get people to present. Um, so that's just a little flavor of sort of the structured didactic uh, education that you get during the residency. Um, and of course, there's most of your learning is happening at readout um, as you rotate through uh, different, different areas. And I also wanted to briefly touch on where people go after they uh, graduate from MGH. So in the most recent year, everybody's doing a fellowship and most of them are doing it at MGH. Um, we have a very good relationship with all the uh, fellowship directors. Obviously it's, it's people you're working with um, throughout your residency. Uh, and so pretty much everyone, and I think this also speaks to um, you know, the quality of the fellowship programs here, but everyone tends to stay um, they, with the exception of um, this year, one person will be going to Boston Children's to do their pediatrics fellowship there. And then, so this is everybody sort of in their fellowship year who just graduated this year, but there's also, um, this is sort of a cross section of, of where people went uh, last year and then the year before that. Oops, apologize for that. Um, and as you can see here, many people are going into academics, but there's also a good amount um, who go into private practice. So people end up all sorts of uh, places after graduating here. And I, I really feel that the uh, alumni network is incredible. Um, you know, after graduating here, it's, it's, um, it really opens up opportunities in terms of wherever you would want to get a job in the US and even internationally. So with that, we can move on. Hey everyone, uh, my name is Tommy. I'm one of the interventional radiology residents. I'm in my fifth year here. And uh, I can speak a little bit to the interventional radiology training here at MGH. Um, and Rory Cochran, another one of the chief residents you heard from is also in our program and can speak a little bit about it as well. So I think the interventional radiology program already did a webinar recently, but for those of you that are interested in IR and were unable to attend, I can briefly go over our curriculum here. Um, if you do match into the IRDR program, we do a general surgery prelim year. Um, and during that year, you're essentially integrated in with all the general surgery residents who are treated exactly the same, and you get a great case experience. I think I scrubbed anywhere between 150 and 200 cases that year. And um, probably the most valuable part of that experience is just the relationships you develop with the surgeons, the surgery residents that'll be your co-residents for the six years you're here at MGH, and your relationships with the attendings uh, in surgery that you know, very frequently, as you'll find, come down to the reading room for, for consults and questions. Um, after your intern year, you'll do three years of diagnostic and eventually take your, uh, your core exam or your board exams. And during those three years, your rotations are exactly the same as the diagnostic residents. So you have the full, you know, diagnostic radiology residency experience that you would get at MGH, which, as you guys know, is just a phenomenal training program with um, experts in their field in every division. And, um, and at the end of those three years, you eventually move on to your IR years. So I've just started my dedicated IR years. I'm in my PGY-5 year. And um, during these years, you spend essentially all of your time on IR or IR-related uh, rotations. Um, one month during this year, I'll be spending a month in the ICU. And then a month later, uh, in my sixth year, I'll do a month of vascular surgery. But 
overall, um, I don't want to talk too long about this, but it's a phenomenal place to do IR. We have great case diversity. We have a robust transplant center. So you have all the cases associated with that. A lot of biliary intervention work, interventional oncology, and then obviously all the bread and butter IR that you would see anywhere, you know, lines, drains, uh, biopsies, et cetera. Um, all the attendings are great to work with, excellent teachers. And uh, I think just the case diversity and volume that we get here is phenomenal. So even if you're not in the IRDR program, we have options to get into um, the IR training pathway here. You know, it's a complicated kind of convoluted um, set of pathways you can get into IR, but we have an ERSIR pathway here, which I think one of the residents in the year below me will be pursuing. And then some people, decide to pursue six months to a year of IR as well as mini, uh, for mini fellowship. So um, there are plenty of options. And if you're interested in IR, I do think this is just a great place to train. Yep, so I'd like to echo basically what Tommy said. Not a whole lot I can add other than to say that it's an amazing place. And of course, to be a good interventionist, you gotta be an outstanding diagnostic radiologist. So um, you will definitely be well-trained uh, if you decide that you wanna go into IR um, by coming here for your diagnostic radiology residency. Next slide. So now we're just going to discuss some of the unique experience that are offered to the residents over their four years. Um, and first, we're going to ask Dr. Mark Succi to talk about the mesh incubator. Thanks, Shauna. Um, hey, everyone. My name is Mark, and uh, I run the mesh incubator. Um, I went to residency here. I did the ER fellowships, so I was that one person, and then uh, sit down as attending. And during that time, uh, with the support of Dr. Uh, Dr. Brink and several others, I was able to create the mesh incubator. And um, essentially what it is, is there's no ACGME accredited education in innovation in med school, as, as you know. So what we do here is we integrate innovation into everyday practice in a few different ways. Um, and I'm gonna show you that. I'm gonna show you some of our outcomes and some of our resident-led projects. So keeping in mind uh, the time, so Mesh is actually a physical lab space next to the reading room. It's got a ton of 3D printer uh, associated stuff, a microprocessor, it's a base for your uh, innovative projects and research. A few things I wanna highlight, we have an education division, something called Mesh Core, which is a five day boot camp that everyone can take. Uh, all, all you residents can take it. We just finished our other one a few weeks ago. It's essentially teaching the fundamentals of innovation so you can talk about it at conferences. Um, Slide is, but um, and uh, you know teaches 3D printing, corporate strategy, entrepreneurship, things like that. We're actually running it at RSNA if you're there, I'm teaching it all day. The ACR featured it as well. Um, and currently we have, we graduated over 40 residents. We have 250 people not in this radiology program system wide that are enrolled. Um, in the on demand online version, we have a device accelerator. If you have any interest in devices, um, we have a ton of projects that have produced patents for uh, eight companies so far. And a lot of residents are leaders in this uh, division as well. We have a systems division that works across Mass General Brigham um, to scale innovative solutions. And I'm gonna show you one of those. We have a bio design division, kind of similar to Stanford bio design, but instead of taking a year off, um, our innovation teams program integrates into your residency practice. So you can be a clinical champion for any number of teams Several of the residents on this call, in fact, created companies out of this um, uh, division. Um, we have a commercialization division, which isn't terribly uh, interesting, but there's a lot going on. Interesting to residents, I should say. And we have a research division. So we do research in operation. We have uh, business executives, residents, um, myself, a few others, vice chairs, and a research group published on revenue uh, aspects of medicine. Um, economic trends and things like that. And you can check our website out for location. Next slide, please. That's our space. It's a little bit of an old picture. You can click through, Stan. Um, you can click through these. Uh, these are just residents highlighting some of the fun they've had. Um, here's Dan of Chande talking about one of the prototypes he made. You can click through. A um, couple other uh, fun tweets um, from our resident class a few years ago. I think one. Oh, and this is Sam uh, learning some AR VR, courtesy of Raul Uppet and Min. Next click. Uh, this is Min, who's actually scoping out his new business. Uh, this was like two weeks ago where we he was in the class. Go ahead. 
Um, this is, I was teaching Craig here how to do a 3D print from a CT scan. So again, it's a smattering of innovative things. You really come out armed uh, to innovate in your daily practice in a practical way. Next slide. Um, it was highlighted by the ACR in a case study. This is our specific. Next slide. Um, some interesting resident spotlights. Um, Brad Translate was a tool we made with several people on this call from the MGH DEI committee uh, who had the idea for an app um, to have different languages give instructions for common exams during COVID. So chest x-rays was a big one. Um, Mesh created the actual technology and the app. We published it. Um, ACR did a case study. Several of the people you see here were involved. I'm going to let them talk about their own parts, but Efren, Dan Chande, Danya Day, and many others. Next clip. Uh, we had a, a really fun publication together. And so this is the type of stuff you have. If you have an idea, come to us, we can make it happen. We have documented clinical outcomes now. Uh, pretty fun. Next slide. Another fun one led by Holly, who was a former chief resident. Uh, when COVID started, her and I worked together to create a low cost face mask, a face shield. This was like 10 cents to, to do. Uh, we sent it to Cornell and their nurses were actually using it for themselves. And the ACR uh, finally did a case study on us again. All credit to Holly for that. Um, we have, and there could be several pages of this, um, several companies and devices that have out of our incubator. Um, for example, the NeoDrain is an IR related device. Fastline is for vascular access. Uh, MinTech is for placement of nasogastric tubes and multiple residents you see on the screen here. Um, this is pretty unique. We have a really unique partnership with Boston Scientific through my position at MGB Corporate. Um, so what we do is we actually take your idea, clinician ideas and fast track them pitching to industry. Um, so here you see out of an RFP we did with 40 applications across the system, uh, 12 final pitches, five were actually from our department. Uh, very, very high uh, representation. Zubini Rani is presenting, um, myself, a few others, John Avic and Florian Fintelman are pitching to Boston Scientific in the next month for their technology. Um, I wanted to show you something very unique that is only at our institution. We have um, recently with MGB Corporate Innovation created um, Mesh Incubator, something called the Innovation Mesh Network, which is an online platform of innovators across all our hospitals. There's 50,000 people in the system. We currently have over 850 people. And what it allows you to do is seek out innovators. For example, here I've selected 3D printing, biotech, artificial intelligence. You can actually find these innovators you know, at the Brigham. Even though you're a you can find an innovator at the Brigham, you can find someone at Faulkner, um, message them and uh, collaborate and you can find investors, co-founders, et cetera, et cetera. We also have our um, core course, our on-demand innovation course on this platform that they can get a certificate signed by the chief innovation officer of our company. So, yeah. uh, this is just a fun picture, that's John Abley. Those of you who know, he's the founding chairman of Boston Scientific. I was at his house two weeks ago with Matt Sims, who invented the smartphone, uh, just talking and filming a session for our network. But this is the kind of um, industry connection, very deep we have and we afford to our residents in this training program. Next slide. The last slide is more of just a hodgepodge of opportunities in the ecosystem. So you don't just join MGH Radiology, you join Harvard. You have a Harvard appointment, um, which means you have access to all the Harvard um, uh, Prizes, all the Harvard resources, the iLab, um, MIT has something called the 100K, uh, which I've experienced in the Harvard iLab has multiple challenges, which multiple residents in the past. Um, Mass challenges over in the Seaport area for those familiar. Mass Med um, gives an information technology award, and we've won it the last six years, three, three of the awards uh, we've won uh, from this residency class, actually. Um, and there's hackathons throughout. So that's essentially kind of a quick rundown of. of what I do and all the residents who've been involved. Um, if you have any questions, you can find me on Twitter or just shoot me a message. I'll uh, respond right away. And uh, thank you so much for being here tonight. Thank you, Mark. Always impressive. And um, next, I want to talk about global health. I had the opportunity to go here a couple of years ago um, as an attending, but I'm going to ask RJ, one of our um, current fellows, to discuss his. Um, experience in Rwanda. Thank you, Shauna. Hey, everyone. I'm RJ, one of the former residents who loved it so much that I stuck around as an abdominal imaging fellow. This will just be a brief little description of what to expect with our global health program. 
As quick background, this all started several years ago when one of our attendings, Dr. Rossman, actually lived in Kigali, the capital of Rwanda, for two years. Uh, while there, he worked at the major teaching hospital and helped establish both the residency program and also helped facilitate radiology, gaining a uh, stronger foothold in the country at large. Um, since then, the relationship that he helped start has gone strong. Every year, we typically have two months out of the year where we are physically on site. Uh, usually, we go in you know, two different month-long groups. These groups will include people at various levels of training. Uh, typically, a few people from our R3 class go, some fellows in various divisions, and of course, some attendings. Uh, while there, we engage in quite a different array of things. Um, clinically, much as you would hear, you'll read CTs and MRIs, ultrasounds, and radiographs. Uh, the notable thing there is, understandably, in Rwanda, the spectrum of pathology is vastly different. So you will learn a great deal just by seeing these different cases and, of course, gaining the insight from uh, the radiologists and radiology residents in Rwanda who see this nearly every day. Um, from an education standpoint, um, you know, we have the luxury of having so many attendings who give us amazing lectures. Uh, so we, in part, try to do the same for the radiology residents in Rwanda. Uh, so both trainees and attendings will be giving lectures to the radiology residents. Uh, and then, as I mentioned, in the teaching, we, we do a lot of teaching ourselves, but we also do a, a great amount of learning. Um, given how different the spectrum of pathology is in that country. And then from just a personal standpoint, uh, during your month there, you'll become very close with our peer trainees in Rwanda, and you'll form some long-lasting relationships. Uh, you know, to this day, you know, a lot of attendings will text each other on WhatsApp groups exchanging cases, and you know, I still engage in WhatsApp messages with many of the people you see in that middle top image there. Um, just as further background here, on the top left, that's a... Uh, a photograph of some of our attendings there in the middle, and then a lot of the residents on the right, um, and then some of the Rwandan attendees in the back. The bottom left is a snapshot on a beautiful day of the major teaching hospital affiliated with the University of Kigali. Um, top right is me with Cerise, one of the residents. Bottom in the middle is uh, Dr. Nimkin with Toussaint, who's uh, graduated by now. And the bottom right is one of our former residents uh, feeding a giraffe because you gotta have some fun with that. Um, there's a lot more about this. Feel free to chime questions in the Q&A, but uh, for now, let's move it along. Thank you. Thank you. So next we're gonna move on to another option that you have to partake in here at MGH, the clinical educator track. And Eric, Jyoti and Francis are gonna talk about this. Hi, uh, I'm Jyoti. I'm one of the radiology residents here. I'm currently in R2. Um, this year, I joined the clinician educator track along with my classmate, Eric Tung. Um, so overall, the program goals are to prepare our radiology residents for careers um, as clinician educators um, in the academic sphere. Um, and this can be anybody really with an interest in teaching. Um, we have a didactic curriculum. Um, we meet once a month. We discuss kind of what our goals are um, in terms of both medical student outreach and also education within the residency program. Um, we have um, a teaching practicum um, with feedback for colleagues and mentors. Um, we have a way to, neither Eric and I have done this yet or reached this stage yet, but we are uh, kind of working on the process of doing a mentored project um, during our training times um, and maybe publishing the results if possible. Um, and we get a lot of mentorship from faculty. So for example, uh, Dr. McDermott uh, and another attending Dr. Shilam um, are involved in kind of mentoring us through this process of going through the clinician educator track um, as an overarching theme, I think the two things that we get involved in are teaching other residents. So later on in this presentation, my colleague, Eric Tung, who's put a lot of effort into um, kind of redoing the first year resident boot camp, um, we'll talk about that. And then another thing is that we have a lot of opportunities to teach medical students at Harvard Medical School, um, both in small group, uh, through small group teaching during their clinical time uh, in their radiology clerkship. Harvard is unique in that it actually has a required radiology clerkship. So you'll get a lot of opportunities to teach medical students. 
Um, and then we also do uh, kind of workstation teaching. So these medical students, when they come here for their clerkship, have a series of lectures in addition to time just at the workstation. And you get kind of one-on-one -on -one teaching uh, practice with them in that setting as well. Um, so currently, the clinician educator track is pretty new. Um, so it's kind of a work in progress in terms of the exact uh, activities that we do throughout the course, but these are our current goals. I'm Francis Dang. I'm one of the former residents and current uh, neuroradiology fellow. And this slide shows our clinician educator track program timeline, which as you can see, spans across all four years of residency. We aim to um, encourage engagement in the educational mission uh, throughout all four years. And these activities are divided into teaching, service, scholarship, and general career development opportunities. So for instance, we encourage taking a teaching skills course early in the residency that's offered through the MG. B and, and then later volunteering for a variety of teaching opportunities, um, which Jyoti mentioned uh, includes the um, required clinical clerkship in radiology, but also preclinical um, and um, uh, 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 courses, and as well as um, teaching first year residents in the boot camp course that Eric will describe in the subsequent slide. Um, residents are encouraged to collaborate with faculty in improving the curriculum in general and also to take part in educational committees at the hospital and enterprise level to see kind of behind the scenes in educational administration in case that is your future career. Some residents have been on national committees as well. And we'd like residents to engage in a scholarly project, which might be editing a textbook, writing a review article, doing educational research, or creating digital teaching content. And then finally, there's just a whole wealth of enrichment opportunities um, offered through the um, hospital um, and through the program. So within the program, you get to meet with like-minded individuals, talk about your interests, and kind of share um, opportunities. Um, and at the hospital level, there are uh, many programs geared towards developing clinician educators, such as the MGB Center of Expertise in Medical Education, which has frequent dinner sessions about career development. The AAMC hosts a uh, medical education research certificate program, and then the um, Harvard Macy Institute has a course geared towards postgraduate trainees who uh, wish to become clinician educators. So I'll talk a little bit about the logistics of the clinician educator track program. Uh, like I said, this is pretty much the first year that residents have gotten involved with this. Um, so this was this initiative was kind of started uh, by Francis uh, and one of our current uh, abdominal imaging mini fellows, uh, Mimi Zhu. Um, and this year, they, along with faculty members, um, kind of took applications um, to be enrolled in the clinician educator track. Uh, basically where you express interest in, you know, education and why you want to join the track. Um, and they selected two residents per year. So that's me and Eric this year. Um, and we have large group sessions that are available to all residents. For example, we had an education week this year where we got various lectures about educational techniques, how to deliver strong lectures, so on and so forth. Um, and then, like I said earlier, the goal is for Eric and I to complete capstone projects um, and develop a teaching portfolio uh, to kind of set us up for careers as clinician educators. Hey everyone, so uh, I'm Eric. I'm one of the second year radiology residents and co-residents with GOT. Um, I'm part of the CET and I wanna just talk about one of our successful initiatives that we did uh, this year, which was expanding our R1 bootcamp lecture series. and. I think uh, as you guys will experience soon enough, you know, without a doubt, the transition from intern year to first year of radiology residency is challenging. And while the hours may be shorter in some cases, I think that new residents um, who come with a lot of different radiology backgrounds are tasked with learning new anatomy, and physics, and findings for very complex imaging modalities. And so to aid in this difficult transition here at MGH and with MGH Radiology, we have a lecture series called the R1 Bootcamp, which is essentially a, a number of lectures that are given by both trainees and attendings in order to provide basic radiology uh, information, as well as information about MGH to the incoming residents. And uh, this year I, you know, was working with some of our, our chiefs and we 
to make some changes to help improve the boot camp. And there were a number of changes that we made this year that I think were really well received. I think one of them was just expanding the boot camp. We we increased it from 28 to 35 lectures and added a number of new lectures uh, based on feedback from uh, uh, my co residents, which were, you know, some of them including. Uh, new uh, basic lectures describing kind of search patterns um, or, or going through kind of dictation language for a lot of common studies. And then in addition to that, you know, with working with the chiefs, we created really a formal curriculum that included a number of learning objectives that created kind of tasks for the new or ones to try to work on and, and achieve in order to uh, uh, really advance their radiology knowledge. We also, one thing that I'm, I'm really passionate about uh, being part of the CET tract is the idea of peer teaching and, and near peer teaching. And I think there's a lot of benefits that you get uh, when you teach a subject in terms of learning that material. And then there's a lot of benefits that your audience gets, especially when they're your peers, because oftentimes as a peer or a near peer, someone who's a slightly more advanced, you can tailor your your um, topic to in a way that's going to be really helpful to the position that they're in because you can empathize with uh, your audience. And so one thing that I'm really proud about is that we increased the amount of peer and near peer teaching in the R1 bootcamp from 46% of our lectures to 77. So we had a number of trainees, including R2s, R3s, R4s and fellows that were participating in the R1 bootcamp and getting this opportunity to teach R1s. And then finally, uh, we created kind of a really robust uh, mechanism of obtaining feedback from the R1 participants as well as the, the, the uh, lecturers and in order to, in the future, kind of help to continue uh, uh, improve this, this lecture series and make sure that it's of high quality and helpful to the new R1s. And so I, I think this year, the, you know, the bootcamp was really well received by this year's residents. And, you know, as someone passionate about medical education, I'm really thrilled to be part of this formal track uh, that's hosted by MGH Radiology. And I feel that it's, it's really kind of amazing to have an MGH radiology leadership that also really uh, kind of embraces residents who are passionate about teaching and allows this opportunity for innovation in medical education. So, uh, so far, this has been a, a really one of the most rewarding of uh, experiences that I've had in MGH radiology. Thanks. Thank you all. Um, next, I'm gonna ask Dr. Dania Day to talk about her experience in the management and leadership training track. Uh, thank you, Shana. And uh, hi everyone, my name is Dania and uh, I'm one of the IR attendees. I'm also a graduate of the DR residency program and the IR fellowship uh, program back when there was an IR fellowship. Uh, so I'll be talking very briefly about the MLT program, which is a program I started back when I was a, a first year uh, resident with support from Dr. McLeod and Dr. Brink. And when we first put together uh, this program, our goal was really to prepare uh, the residents who are interested in becoming future leaders in healthcare and in radiology by providing them with different training opportunities to achieve that goal. So we designed the program around four different components, a didactic training component where uh, you attend a number of lectures uh, throughout your residency, an experiential learning component where you get to uh, shadow some of the leaders in the hospital as well as the leaders in the department uh, and uh, get exposure to what they do. A scholarship component where you do a, a project focused on management uh, and leadership or health policy. And a mentorship component, which is a longitudinal component where you get mentorship uh, from key leaders, uh, both in the hospital and the department. Next slide, please. So uh, similar to the CT program that you just uh, heard about, uh, the MLT program is also a longitudinal program that spans all four years of uh, residency. Usually the residents are selected in the first year uh, of the program. And uh, in year two and three, the expectation is to attend all the didactic lectures that are uh, offered usually about more or less once per month. You will also start your uh, management and leadership uh, project during that time. And in year two and year three, you'll participate in electives uh, around uh, radiology MLT uh, practicum, uh, which consists of uh, shadowing key uh, leaders in the department and the hospital. So uh, to tell you about my experience in my uh, second year, I shadowed Dr. Brink and a number of the vice chairs uh, in the department and uh, got a lot of exposure to uh, what they do day to day. And in my third year, I shadowed uh, the president of the hospital at that point was Dr. Slavin, and as part of the uh, two weeks, I actually got to attend uh, one of the meetings of the board of trustees of the hospital. I also got to 
uh, go to a number of the general executive council meetings of the hospital and it was a very eye opening experience. Uh, I also had a mentor uh, assigned uh, throughout the program. And in year four of the program, I actually did spend six months of my fourth year of residency doing a focus MLT experience. For my experience, I uh, ended up uh, uh, working with uh, the senior vice president for quality and safety for the hospital and uh, uh, did uh, uh, work with the Lawrence Center for Quality and Safety. And that work actually prepared me very well to become the IR quality uh, director, which I am right now. Next slide. Uh, so for uh, the program, uh, we select uh, typically one to two residents in the spring semester of the uh, first year. And uh, people who complete all four components of the program that I uh, just mentioned uh, will get a certificate in health management uh, and leadership at the end of the program. Thank you very much, Daniel. And now I'm going to ask... Um, Min Avik and one of our other attendings, Dr. Arfan Flores, to talk about the many research opportunities available to residents here at MGH. Thanks, Shana. Uh, so my name is Avik Som. I am a PGY4 R3 uh, in the IRDR program. And uh, my colleague, uh, Min Lang, will also be uh, presenting some of the slides with me in addition with the faculty. Uh, Basically, research at MGH is deeply ingrained, and there are a plethora of options. During your actual clinical reading opportunities, you'll definitely run into various clinical questions um, that'll be generated based on the huge amounts of data that imaging provides. Uh, particularly, the research at MGH is split basically into multiple different centers. Um, so for instance, there's a clinical data science that particularly looks at artificial intelligence and building on how you actually make radiology better. There is more imaging focused, building better uh, MRIs, ultrasounds. And then uh, if in a physical format, MGH is actually closer to MIT than it necessarily is to the Longwood and Harvard campuses. And as a result, uh, multiple faculty and projects are available uh, just across the river, uh, which has always been sort of an exciting and something for up for grabs. Uh, uh, for the residents throughout the program. Uh, we can go to the next slide. Hi, everyone. I'm in one of the uh, R3 radiology residents. Um, you know, the previous picture describes our program perfectly. If you're into research, it's like a kid coming to a candy store. Uh, regardless of what you're interested in, in terms of research, you can find it here. We have a diversity of ideas, whether you're interested in basic science research. Uh, new imaging modalities, new MR sequences, machine learning, policy disparity, clinical research, or operational research, you can find this here at MGH. Um, we have faculty with you know, multiple uh, teaching and practice interests. If you're interested in neuroradiology, in MSK, in chest, basic science, again, we have faculty that can help you with any type of research that you're interested in. And all ideas are really welcome. If you have any idea of any type of research that you're interested in, you can find a faculty here who's willing to mentor you, to sit down with you, to brainstorm through your research hypothesis, and really help you to put together an IRB and really construct a uh, well-designed study. And we also have a lot of infrastructure and support here for residents to do research. Uh, for example, dedicated academic time, uh, which you can apply for uh, up to two weeks every six months, you can get uh, academic time to do research, which, which was really helpful for me to collect a lot of data, and also access to the resources that Avik mentioned on the previous slide. I think this slide uh, sort of emphasizes what Min has already been talking about. A couple of things that I would add uh, that in this residency, so I did an MD-PhD, and so when I was looking at radiology programs, I was really interested in seeing how can research merge with uh, a clinically heavy specialty like radiology. And so MGH is fantastic. As Min mentions, we can apply what is effectively two weeks every six months. In addition, during our uh, mini fellowship year, uh, we can actually get up to about six months of dedicated research time. Uh, the time and financial support for resident presentations at national and international conferences appears to be one of the best. Essentially, if you have a presentation, you can be paid to go. Um, Pre-COVID, that meant going out to conferences directly. Uh, you know, even with COVID, of course, we now have even larger sort of Zoom conferences. And what's exciting is, is that 
Uh, one of the biggest conferences in radiology is the RSNA conference. And that in the third year, the program is able to give a very generous support uh, as we found out to actually spend a week, which is a fantastic time to really get to know the rest of your classmates, but also be able to go there without necessarily the pressures of, I have to present, I have to do another sort of a research project or so forth, but just be able to take in that environment. Uh, now here's an example of you know, some of the things that we have done through residency and research. Um, in the beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic, Avek and I were really interested in working on research in this field. We approached the chest division and within a couple of days, you know, we got pulled a lot of data out of our hospital system. And within a week or so, we published our first paper and subsequently more papers. And we were actually one of the first groups to propose vascular abnormality as the underlying pathophysiology of COVID-19 related lung injury. And, you know, we worked with a lot of great attendings, Dr. Flores, Dr. Mendoza, Dr. Little, Dr. Shepard, who all really became our mentors in research, but also became people that, you know, we could depend on for various other things that's not medicine related. Now we come for about emailing them or texting them, asking them any questions that I really have. You know, with research, a lot of that also has to do with how much funding different places get. Um, and as everyone looks at sort of US news rankings, research funding ends up going into quite a bit. MGH radiology apparently is number one in uh, research funding. I think at some point there was a, a talk where Dr. Brink mentioned that we bring in more research funding than we necessarily do the clinical side. So research is sort of potentially one of our primary uh, operational funding sources. Uh, and that does extend to residents, uh, particularly in the sense that you have a tremendous amount of infrastructure. And in addition to that, uh, there are several radiology specific grants, particularly from the RSNA, AUR, RARS, uh, which provide grants that help fund for the, for instance, the six months of protected research time. Um, for the last several years, there's been at least one resident that has gotten the RSNA research award uh, and that has provided uh, exciting thing, almost to a point that it almost seems like a near guarantee when you come to MGH. Uh, that's how supported it is. What, um, one of the things that I wanted to emphasize, uh, Ming and Abby have talked in terms of research and the uh, wide variety of ideas, but more than that, one of the things that was mentioned on one of the slides is that research is seen as an opportunity to enhance your ideas and more to build your career. Research is not forced or anything. It's just something that spontaneously happens during read out conversations, regardless of level of uh, research training that you had before or experience before that is something that is encouraged and supported regardless of the background that you have and the idea as well. All ideas truly are welcome. This is an environment that Dr. Brink mentioned is pretty open and supportive of the residency and it's, uh, our residents are truly one of our, um, are definitely our, our priority as we see today here. If you can move, um, I think we can move on to the next slide. And more than just the diversity of ideas in research and, and what we can do, and also it's very important that we mentor research the next generation and also welcome everyone from uh, diverse backgrounds. And that's part of the work that we do through the equity and inclusion work that is not only related to um, the community outreach or the diversity and inclusion, the equity, but it's like different aspects that we do. We talk about research, leadership in this space, education, for example, like our, our current resident, Dan Chande, is leading an institutional effort called the People's Heart, which started within radiology and now uh, it's become a more of an institutional resource. And that it's another example as we discussed today, the MESH incubator, the MLT, these are a lot of like resident driven program, the uh, CET program, the, it's just so many resident driven programs that what we provide here for our, when you come here is a welcoming environment that will foster your career development and truly um, foster your pursuit of your passion and your interest. Nothing is forced here or anything on the contrary, really what uh, we thrive on finding and supporting your passion so you can be successful while you're here and then move forward and become academic or um, radiologist and a leader in, or a leader in your private practice. 
And um, now I think Dania is going to talk, discuss a little bit more about the Center for Diversity and Inclusion and some of the um, other offerings in the diversity and inclusion space. Uh, thank you, Efren. And just to echo what you said, uh, I think it's important to say that diversity and inclusion is really at the center of a lot of what we do uh, in the department. And there are a lot of opportunities for anyone interested in this work to be uh, involved either through our many outreach programs or through uh, research, as Dr. Flores mentioned. And uh, just uh, very briefly, we also have the Center for Diversity and Inclusion uh, here at the hospital level that uh, does have a resident and fellow committee and many opportunities uh, to be involved. And uh, every year they put a number of uh, hospital-wide networking events. Uh, they have a mentorship uh, network, as well as a number of community service uh, opportunities uh, for, for anyone interested. Just want to talk a little about women in radiology. So here at MGH Radiology, about a third of the um, faculty are women. Same with fellows and just a little under 30% of residents are women currently in the division. And um, we're always trying to improve our program to um, make it more attractive to women joining us. Um, and we have set up a women in radiology group or Dr. Dania Day was one of the co-founders and um, which we used to have some social events and also events to um, help um, academically help women in radiology um, within MGH and even within the New England area. So I'd like Dania to just discuss some more of the events that we have had in this group. So, so as Dr. McDermott mentioned, uh, we have a very uh, active uh, women in radiology group, especially before uh, COVID. And we used to hold uh, events uh, almost every other month and sometimes every month. Uh, and uh, those events are really focused around community building uh, for uh, women in the department, as well as uh, uh, men uh, who are uh, supportive of uh, many of our events. And uh, we uh, have been very fortunate to be able to bring a number of uh, high profile speakers, including Dr. Uh, McGinty uh, during one of our last uh, uh, talks that we have put together. We also had a number of uh, networking receptions. You can see many of the pictures uh, from our previous events. We also had a number of uh, book clubs uh, that uh, were uh, uh, very uh, well attended. So uh, it's a great community to be involved in and uh, uh, to really get to meet and network with uh, many of the women in the department. Hi, Ron. My name is Madi. I'm one of the uh, PGYRA fives in the integrated IR and DR um, residency program. And I just want to talk a little bit about my experience uh, participating in the Women in IR events. Um, I kind of just started going to them as a R1, and I was impressed by how many people were there. Um, as a result, I really got to uh, bond with not only my co-residents, but also the fellows and attendings. So in this photo um, up in the corner, that's actually me um, and two of my co-residents, Mimi and Holly with Dr. Amy Patel at one of the talks. Uh, this was the talk about social media and I think Holly and Mimi made a Twitter right after that. But I think as a result of these events, um, Holly and Mimi have become two of my closest friends. Um, we also talk about a lot of issues um, that are brought up in these discussions. Uh, as Danya mentioned, she was excellent bringing in um, very high profile speakers like Dr. Meltzer and Dr. McGinty, who gave really uh, inspirational talks um, and, you know, kind of inspired me to get involved a little bit in uh, women in IR. So I was really appreciative of that. And lastly, I think what I've also benefited from is a lot of attending um, interest. So that photo down in the corner um, with all of us sitting around in a circle, that's actually one of our attendings, uh, Dr. Hillary Kelly who hosted a book club at her place. Um, and it was just a really good discussion. And I think we all had a lot of fun and it uh, really opened up the um, discourse about some very interesting issues. And I've just really benefited from participating in this in more ways than I ever thought I would. And I uh, feel very fortunate to be um, working with so many great women in radiology. Thank you, Mari. Um, so moving on, we're just gonna um, discuss some of the wellness options and opportunities that take place in the MGH radiology. And we've got Jyoti, Erica, and Laura to discuss this. 
Thanks so much, uh, Dr. McDermott. So my name is Laura. I'm one of the uh, second year residents um, and a member of the wellness committee along with Erica and Jyoti. Um, and, and so we thought we would share a little bit with you what that means in our residency program. Um, so I think the term wellness is sort of thrown around a lot in medicine. Um, there are no mandatory wellness lectures involved in the wellness committee. Um, I think the department, um, in addition to sort of the events for the whole department, allocates an annual budget for resident wellness, which can be used sort of flexibly um, for anything that promotes wellness, whether it be, you know, um, events, you know, pastries, kind of the full gamut. Um, and we sent out a survey to sort of get a sense of what residents are interested in, and we sort of plan our events based on that. Um, there's also a larger wellness initiative at Mass General, um, which Erica can talk about in a little more detail, but I'll just turn it over to Jyoti now, who will give you sort of a sense of what activities we've done lately. Yeah, so as Laura was saying, um, the wellness committee is very laid back. We kind of just throw events for residents to get together and have a fun time and form bonds between residents of different classes, although we have had single class events in the past. Um, some of these pictures are from before my time uh, at MGH, but um, you can see that they've had a Christmas party, they have candle pin bowling, they've gone skating, apple picking. So far during uh, my, Laura, and Erica's time uh, as wellness chairs, uh, we've had a few different events. Laura organized, as you can see on the top left of the screen, um, a bunch of people went to a Red Sox game together and enjoyed that. Um, we have breakfasts from the Close By Flower Bakery and Cafe, which has amazing baked goods. We bring pastries about you know once a month-ish uh, for all the residents to enjoy and have a nice breakfast. Um, we did a happy hour uh, at a local tavern called the Bell in Hand recently, um, and everyone got together for that. That was really fun. Um, the first year is kind of at the bottom left, um, had a get together at Harpoon Brewery, um, kind of in the middle at the bottom. You can see that there was an event to kind of welcome the first years to the residency. Um, which I think was also at the bell in hand. At the bottom right, you can see that we had uh, pizza for all the residents. Um, and then the two pictures on the right at the top were, were not really related to the wellness committee, but just a testament to kind of how close we are as a residency. Um, one of our classmates got married uh, there in the center recently in Newport, Rhode Island, um, and invited our entire class. Um, and most of us were able to go and, and celebrate with her. And you can see at the top right that we, we threw her a little bachelorette event. Um, and you can see that myself and Laura and Erica are all there. Um, so we're, we're very close as a residency. We get together a lot and you know we're grateful to have the wellness uh, committee and the wellness funding to kind of throw events for us to just have fun and spend time together as friends. And I'll hand it off to Erica to talk about the larger MGB uh, initiative. Thanks, Jyoti. Um, yeah, so wellness at MGH is definitely a priority and you can feel that from not just our radiology residency wellness committee, but um, there are several other resources and opportunities outside of the program that um, the hospital offers us. And there is a larger MGB Wellbeing Residency Council that I'm a part of for as a representative for the radiology residency. And through that, there's been lots of fun events as well. Like this past year, they did for the first time a radiology, um, sorry, not radiology, just across the board, resident and fellow um, appreciation week. And that was an awesome event where they had numerous events throughout the week that were free. Uh, various workout classes, comedy shows that you could um, attend. Um, most of it was virtual this year. And we got free meals, which we got to choose from several different restaurants around the hospital for different lunches. Um, and there were different raffles and things to win prizes. So that was great. Um, and through that uh, well-being council, there's a lot of resources as well for mental health, um, peer support and counseling um, that are really important as well. And outside of the MGB Wellbeing Council, there's various opportunities for wellness as well. Um, recently, there's this new Med in Motion trial that a lot of us are doing in the residency that um, 
randomizes you into groups and it's an exercise based program and um, kind of fosters community building and uh, competition as well. Um, so it's pretty fun. Um, so yeah, wellness is definitely important in, uh, in our program and across the board at MGH. Thank you very much for that. And now I'm just going to ask Rachel, Willie, and Bruno to just discuss some of the living in Boston. Hi, everybody. I'm Rachel. I'm one of the second year residents uh, in radiology. And I just, um, I know we're running out of time here, but I want to make just a couple of points about um, your, uh, those of you who have a partner and those of you who may have a family or are considering starting a family during residency. Um, so as you know, MGH is based in Boston and it's a fantastic place. Uh, whether you have a partner who's in medicine or not. Um, specifically, I know some of you may be thinking about the couples match and um, maybe you know this from the interview process, but there are many medical institutions in Boston um, where they have an opportunity to apply, including MGH. So that's one thing that um, we would love to hear about if you have a partner who's also applying in medicine the same year and you guys are doing the couples match, um, let us know. Uh, we'd love to hear about that multiple people coming uh, to Boston in medicine. Um, but then secondly, you know, if you have a partner who's not in medicine, but who would be moving with you, um, there are many opportunities for other careers in Boston. Finance, law, tech is big in Cambridge and growing in the seaport. There are multiple other graduate institutions, business, law, um, what have you. It's just a, a world-class city with a ton of diversity and a ton to do. Um, so moving on sort of to the, the family and children piece, it's a very family friendly residency. I can kind of attest actually, I was kind of in the unique situation. I had my first child um, the second week of starting residency and people could not have been more friendly and welcoming um, and generous. And this kind of talks to the, the culture of MGH radiology, but people are really both your co-residents and the attendings could not be sort of more supportive and excited for you. And it's that kind of place. It's not something that you kind of have to have on the side in the shadows. It's something that people are so thrilled um, to share in with you. Um, and so I, you know, you have the typical ABR uh, residency leave policy. I had a wonderful maternity leave. Um, and there's multiple supports that I actually learned about oftentimes through my um, co-residents, a couple of um, girls two years ahead of me had had a child and were able to tell me everything I needed to know about sort of lactation support and backup childcare, which is actually right on campus at MGH, was an, an incredible resource. Um, and then on the MGH resource, there's a treasure trove of all resources. There's blogs on how to deal with sort of childcare during COVID, um, different parent support things. So there's really just, um, an incredible sort of endless amount of support and but just more most importantly i think i want to emphasize that the culture of mgh is is very family friendly and supportive and um uh excited about family life hi all i'm uh, will terrell <clears throat> i'm a pgy5 here um, i'm originally from the west coast um, but i just wanted to talk to you kind of about some of the many residency benefits we have. I also have two children and I'll just dovetail off of what Rachel said that the paternity and maternity leave policies here are excellent. There's a ton of support for families, like she said, both with the attendings and the fellow residents. Um, and also that backup daycare is, is, is amazing. Um, you know, you can get your child in there in, in very short notice and they'll actually even come to your house um, if, if that's necessary or, or, you know, can kind of meet your schedule. Also, you know, Boston's an incredible city. You're obviously going to get a world-class education and training if you come here. Uh, on top of that, you know, with world-class cities, obviously, you know, we always worry about price. I found the compensation package here to be quite generous. Uh, and as well, we have an excellent moonlighting opportunity. Um, most of our, you know, uh, residents who are in their second through fourth and fifth years here, if they choose to do fellowship here, um, make about $2,400 a month doing contrast coverage moonlighting. And the great thing about that is that it's, you know, you're, you're helping make sure that everything runs safely and smoothly, but it's not terribly labor intensive, which is a great time for you to, one, you know, I did most of my board studying during moonlighting, so you're essentially getting paid to study for the boards. Um, on top of that, it's a great time to work on research or, you know, just build your clinical skills. So it gives you a lot of flexibility. Um, and, you know, for me having a family, it's a great time to get out and have that dedicated time to do those things. And, you know, like we say, the average is $2,400 a month. There are many months where I've made far in excess of that. So both the generous pay 
and the moonlighting opportunities allow you to both live in an amazing city and really get to enjoy it because you have you know financial means to do so. So if you're worried at all about you know coming to Boston because of cost, you really shouldn't. You know, I have two kids, like I said, we live in a very nice apartment right across the street from the hospital, and you know, it's all perfectly feasible for the compensation package that you can get here. And you can even start moonlighting within your first year <clears throat> at the second half of your first year. So, you know, not too many programs offer that. And then once you get that full license, you can really take advantage of a lot of moonlighting opportunities. We have three sites and are expanding that um, off campus as well as a site on campus for moonlighting. Um, and then just briefly, the, getting into some of the other benefits, the health benefits you're going to get here are amazing. Um, you know, I don't think you could find a much better uh, benefits package anywhere else. Um, and again, for a person with, you know, a family, I think it makes a huge difference financially. Um, so that's, that's what I have to say. I hope to see you all in Boston. Thank you so much for coming and I'll pass it off to Bruno. Hi everyone. My name is Bruno. I'm one of the, um, I'm one of the 30 residents and, um, and also one of the chief residents. Thank you all for being here. Um, we're going to talk about housing really quick. Um, so um, MGH is situated in the West End. Uh, you can see the cursor there. Um, most residents live um, actually um, either you know near um, either near the hospital. Uh, you can see that apartment building uh, on the top right. Um, I think that is the Emerson building. Um, there there are um, um, there are many apartment buildings around the area. Uh, you can see Beacon Hill, which is circled in green. Um, a lot of residents live there as well. Um, some residents actually also live near the TD Garden, uh, which is near the north end, but it's actually in the north station. Um, all of these, um, all of these apartment complexes are usually about, I would say, five to ten minutes from the hospital. Um, you know, so it's usually a very short walk. Um, many residents also live in Cambridge. You can see there um, that it's circled in blue. Um, I actually live in East Cambridge, um, and I have two other colleagues um, who also live there as well. It's you know, it's usually about a fifteen to twenty minute walk. Um, most people walk some people bike to work. Um, some people live in South Boston as well, which you can't really see, um, which you can't really see in this picture. Um, and then others also live in Back Bay, which you can see over there that's circled. Um, that's right next to the Boston Commons, which I'll talk about later, you know, but that's also about a um, 50 to 20 minute walk from the hospital. Um, and then some other residents live in the suburbs, you know, so those, um, as those who have families or, um, or who want to live in a house. Um, and, you know, that can be in Medford, that can be in Norwood. I know that we have a resident that lives there. Um, and then those residents usually drive, um, and then some will take public transportation. We can go to the next slide. So um, a little bit about life in Boston. So I'll talk about the Charles River because it's actually a very, very gorgeous river um, that we can actually see from the hospital. So the Charles River essentially divides uh, Boston and Cambridge. Um, it's a very, very long river um, with um, with a very nice boardwalk that you can walk through. It's a very, very nice place to walk, to run. Um, a lot of people also um, um, also kayak in the river, which is quite nice uh, in the summertime. Uh, you can see the picture on the top left. Uh, you can see people running, so that's along the Esplanade. Um, you can see the one in the bottom right. Um, that's actually the um, Hatch Shells, which is an amphitheater, which usually has live concerts, um, and that's also um, and that's also along the Esplanade. Um, yeah, so a really nice place to walk to, to run, um, and to kayak, and also to bike. So uh, the Boston Public Garden and the Commons, uh, you can see they're circled in gray. It's actually close to the hospital. It's about a um, it's about a 10 to 15 minute walk. Um, very very nice park it looks absolutely gorgeous in the fall with the changes uh, in the leaves um, and then you can also see uh, you can also see in the bottom picture there there's an ice skating rink uh, it's usually open in the winter of course and it's usually packed with people ice skating but it's a very nice park to walk to next slide so i'll talk about some other neighborhoods in boston that i particularly like so if you look at the picture on the top left there, you can see the north end. The north end, I would say, is also about 10 to 15 minutes from the hospital. Um, it's an Italian neighborhood, has really, really good Italian food. Um, and the picture on the bottom left uh, is actually a picture of, uh, of the north end. Um, you know, so you can find very, very, um, very good Italian food there. And then across the river, you can see East Boston. Um, and the picture on the right is actually from the perspective of, um, of East Boston. 
And I actually really like East Boston. Um, it's very Hispanic. There's really, really good Hispanic food, very good Colombian food, and very good Peruvian food, which I really enjoy. Um, so it, it's a really, really great area. And I also play soccer there as well. Um, there's a big soccer culture there. Next slide. So um, food, pretty, I would say pretty diverse food in Boston, actually. Um, among, among the things that I really like um, and that Boston is known for, of course, is seafood, um, specifically shellfish. So it's very good lobster, very good oysters. Um, if you look at the picture on the top right, uh, Neptune Oysters, a pretty famous restaurant um, that, um, that specializes in seafood and that's in the North End. There's another one um, called Roll 34 that's really good. Um, the picture in the middle, um, in the top middle, is a place called Ruka, which is actually um, a fusion of, um, of Peruvian food, um, Japanese food and Chinese food. Very, very good as well. Um, but I would say that the food is pretty diverse and I've actually grown to really enjoy it. And then the picture on the bottom left um, is actually a brewery. Uh, it's the Owl's Nest and it's from Night Shift Brewery. You can see here that um, it's actually along the Esplanade and you get a really nice view of the river um, and of the Longfellow Bridge, which is one of the bridges that connects, um, that connects Boston to Cambridge. And then the picture on the bottom right is a Trillium Beer Garden, um, which there are many locations, but this one is in Fenway, which is quite nice. Um, during the summertime, the spring and the fall, um, there's usually a beer garden that's open there and it's a really nice place to get together with everyone. All right, next slide. So I'll talk a little bit about the Seaport District because this area is one that I actually really enjoy as well. So just to get some perspective, uh, you can see Beacon Hill there on the map. Uh, you can see the Boston Commons and the Boston Public Garden. You see the financial district. And then across the river, you see there, um, you see that there's a Seaport District. So um, you guys saw the picture before um, of the first year resident in um, Harpoon Brewery, I believe it was. So the Seaport District about, um, about five years ago was just that brewery. There was not much going on. Now there are many buildings, many restaurants, many bars, a lot of places to go out. It's actually a very, very nice area. Um, and the pictures um, um, on the bottom um, are, um, are in the Seaport District. One thing that's really nice about that is that there are many high rises there um, and there are these restaurants um, in the rooftops in which you can you know, eat some really good food and have a beautiful view of the city. Next slide. All right, so I'll draw your attention to the map. So um, I live in Cambridge, as I said, and I really, really like Cambridge. Um, a lot of my colleagues also live there. Um, some other parts in Cambridge that I, um, that's actually a little bit north of Cambridge um, is Somerville, which you can see there on the map. Um, Somerville, um, lots of Brazilians there. I'm actually Brazilian. Um, I really enjoy going there. There's really good food in the area. There's a brewery there that we like to go to that's called uh, Aeronaut Brewery. You can see the picture on the bottom left here. Um, actually with some of our residents, Manny is there uh, with his wife Alejandra. Uh, my wife Christina is there um, and then Min. Um, and then the other three people in the back are actually friends of mine who are not in the residency, but lots of lots to do there. Um, the picture on the top right um, is a picture of MIT. It's actually the Great Dome is what it's called uh, in that building. Um, and it's overlooking the Charles River. Uh, and then on the opposite end of it is gonna be Boston. And then the one on the bottom right um, is Bow Street Market, which is in Somerville also. And that's a really cool place um, with lots of places to eat and drink. Um, and we really enjoy going there as well. Next slide. So if you like sports, um, I really, really enjoy sports. Um, I'll be honest, I am not a Celtics fan. Um, I'm a Miami Heat fan, but um, you know, there's, there's, uh, there's the Celtics, there's the Patriots, there's the Bruins, there's the Red Sox. Um, I, you know, like I love it that here that all the fans are very, very passionate. You know, um, if there's a game on, everyone's going to take it seriously. It's actually a very, very cool culture. And then, of course, um, there's a lot of rowing here. Um, it's very popular in Harvard and in New England in general. Um, and then a big running culture here as well. Um, you'll see a lot of runners along the commons, excuse me, um, uh, along the Charles River. And if we go to the next slide. So just a little bit about New England, because I feel like there's a lot to do um, outside of Boston as well. Um, even if you don't have a car, I didn't have a car in the beginning. So what we did was that we got zip cars uh, and we actually get an employee discount um, um, for zip cars, which is quite nice. But um, so the picture on the top left is a picture of my wife and we were in Acadia. Um, very, very beautiful. I, I highly recommend doing that. Um, 
um, you know, going to see the national park. So that's in uh, Bar Harbor in Maine. It's about a four and a half hour drive from here, but very, very beautiful, especially in the fall. The picture in the top middle is actually in Cape Cod. Uh, it's in Provincetown. Very, very nice. Um, you know, coming from Miami and from Brazil, I really thought that, you know, like I wasn't expecting much from the beaches here, but there's actually a very strong beach culture here in New England, which I've actually grown to really enjoy. The picture on the top right um, is in Portland, Maine. Fantastic restaurants. I, I highly recommend visiting. Very, very beautiful place. Um, the picture on the bottom right is uh, a picture of my wife and I in Narragansett Beach in Rhode Island which is actually very, very nice. And then the one on the bottom left uh, is a picture in one of the ski resorts in Vermont. You know, so that's something that's nice to do uh, during the winter, of course. I'm actually trying to learn how to snowboard, so hopefully I'll be able to do that um, at some point. But anyway, Boston, very, very diverse, great food, great restaurants, great bars, um, lots of breweries, lots to do, great sports. Um, I think that you guys will really, really enjoy it. And one last thing, if you do like surfing, I'm very, very big on surfing. You can actually surf here quite a lot. Uh, and it's very, very nice. Um, if you guys have any questions about Boston, of course, you're more than welcome to ask. Thank you. Thank you, Bruno. Um, so we're finishing up um, in time for the big game. Um, hopefully we've answered all your questions that you have about the residency program and also working at MGH and living in Boston and the surrounding areas. Um, Obviously, you probably will come up with questions. Feel free to contact any of us um, via email or social media.